Thank you, Richard, for the introduction. I'm very grateful that this country adopted me, and I'm very proud to be a New Zealander. In the next little while, I hope to share with you uh, my journey and to convince you that in life, they are not ordinary moments. As Richard said, I was born uh, in a tiny village in South of Malaysia. And this was a house I was um, brought up in. And the photograph with me sitting on a dog <laughs> in front of the house. From a very young age, I aspired to be a doctor. But all odds were stacked against me. We were poor. There were 14 children. Life's about going to the plantation after school, on the weekends, and during school holidays. I went to the local school um, in which everything was taught in Chinese. And this was the high school I attended, and the photograph there was when I was 14. I decided towards the end of my high school that I wanted to go to a Western country. But there was a problem. I couldn't speak English. So I attended the Taylor's College, which was run by the Australians in Kuala Lumpur. And I was there for nine months. And I learned English by reading a newspaper from the page one to the last page every day. I got a certificate, which allowed me to go to Melbourne and into Melbourne Medical School, University Medical School. And I put through myself um, by working part-time in the supermarket, cleaning the floors, and during my summer vacations, working in a warehouse, driving forklift. From there, I came to New Zealand uh, to Waikato Hospital. And as Richard said, I was effectively kicked out because the immigration rule at that time was that you shall live. I came to New Zealand because during my elective, I was given an opportunity to come to New Zealand to spend 12 weeks here at Wanganui Hospital. And I fell in love in this place and its people. And I really truly thought New Zealanders were colored blind. My first run as a house surgeon was plastic surgery, and I was immediately taken by the life-changing nature of that specialty. But there was a dream because I had just arrived as a foreigner. And at that time, there were four training positions in the country, and one would come up every three years. But during my journey, there were loads of people who gave me a hand and gave me a chance. Plastic surgery allowed me to help someone like David, who was born with a paralyzed face, to make him able to smile. By the way, David has now become a doctor. Someone with cancer and someone with trauma. After completing my training in plastic surgery, I went overseas. And one of the places I went to was Oxford. I worked for this man, Professor Poole, who was one of my mentors. And I wanted to learn more about cranial facial surgery. This was a woman born with eye sockets at different height. And through cranial facial surgery, you can try to label them. Whilst I was in Oxford, I published this paper, Non-Surgical Treatment of Auricular Anomalies. This was kind of mad because I was a surgeon talking about non-surgical treatment. Now this picture, it's a, it's a, what we call a shell year, because the year looks like a shell in a child. And I knew that at that time, the treatment for this would be surgery, and you had to wait till the child is six years of age, and then you try to make it into a normal year. But you can't, because it's not possible. This was what was that. I, I went to the hardware shop and got the solder wire, and then put this in a plastic tube, 
a malleable splint. And the basis of this is that this year is soft and you can mold it in any shape you like, but you've got to keep it in that shape. So with this little splint that costs 50 cents, we got paper tapes put on by the parents. And you can see after two months later, this year was changed. And something, it's not normal, but normal enough. This convinced me that in order to achieve paradigm shifts, you need to come up with radical concepts. From there, I went to Harvard and worked for Professor Mulligan to further my interest in cranial facial surgery. Children born with really awful cranial facial anomalies. But as life would have it, I became interested in these conditions. These are vascular birthmarks. They are all different and they are pretty hideous, for which there are no good treatment. On my return to New Zealand at the end of 95, I decided to establish a service to help patients with these problems. And I assembled a team of people with different skills try to help these patients. Because there was no good treatment for this con these conditions, I assembled a team to begin research into them. The most common type of vascular birthmark is a strawberry birthmark, which affects about 10 percent of children. It is a tumor, it grows quickly over several months, and then it gradually regress, usually leaving a fatty lump. It is disfiguring, but often it causes functional problem and in fact can be life-threatening. In 1996, there was no satisfactory treatment for this condition. For this child, one month old, with a strawberry birthmark in the eye socket, you can see the white structure around the eyeball. This child will go blind if you don't treat her. The first line treatment was high dose steroid. This is the medication you take for arthritis and asthma. Here, one month, seven months, and two years later. Now, this is considered to be a wonderful result, but it occurs only in 30% of cases. In 40%, all you do is to stop the growth of the tumor, and the rest will continue to grow. Such is this. And then you resort to interferon treatment, which means daily injections for 10 months. This was a good result. But centers around the world stop using this because one in four children will never walk again because it, that medication affects the spinal cord. So many centers around the world turn to chemotherapy. So as a specialist, the conventional treatment is that try not to do anything if you can because the treatment often is worse than the condition. But in a situation like this, where it threatens the vision, you have to do something. Then you turn to steroid to stop the growth. And then, over time, you do surgery and laser. And this was the end outcome of the treatment. I think you will agree with me, if you put the two side by side, the photos side by side, it's wonderful. But it is not good treatment. This took 10 years. And during the time, the child lost the confidence. Now, this is yet another child, one of my first patients when I returned from the States. She, has, she had this fatty lump on the cheek and the upper lip as a result of a strawberry birthmark. This is what I did for her with plastic surgery. Now, Laura and her family were delighted with the result. But I was profoundly unhappy because her mother showed me these photographs. And I thought, we should have a treatment between those photographs. But we, we didn't have one because we didn't know what causes this condition. I believe then that if we were to come up with a better treatment, we need to work out what causes it. And I decided that I will retrain as a research scientist. And that was a photograph of me, um, just in, enrolled to do a part-time PhD student part-time PhD, and scientists like evidence. And this is the evidence that at once upon a time, I had a tough of black hair, <laughs> <laughs> trying to be a scientist. 
I'm indebted to Dr. Paul Davis at the School of Medicine who took me on despite the fact that I had no experience whatsoever about bench work. And you can see me there hiding behind knowing my place. Because for six months I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> now, having no record also puts you in a position that you can't get research grants. And I had many rejections, and uh, this is one of them. But I thought that it was very important that we figure out what happens between these photographs. And I used to operate all day and then go to the lab in the evening to work, but I thought that could not carry on forever. One evening, I decided to invite groups of friends at the dinner, and after some good food and wines, I said, look, how about helping me set up this charity? They agreed to it. I'm not sure if some of them regretted it. But <laughs> this was meant to raise money for research. And this was one of the uh, fund fundraising events at Government House. And Sir Michael Haribo is now also a patron of our trust. Now, there were loads of things stacked against us. In any investigation, you need a concept. The prevailing concept then was that this is a tumour and this is a problem with blood vessel cells. But this child was referred to me with a cleft on the sternum, and this gave me, led me to develop a concept that this is a problem with stem cells. And if that is so, these cells must be controlled by primitive systems. We now know that strawberry birthmark is caused by stem cells from the placenta. And we also are able to grow the stem cells from strawberry birthmark. We make them into bone cells fat cells, and in fact, red blood cells. We asked the question, what control these stem cells? And we discovered an inbuilt hormone system, which until now had been known only to regulate blood pressure. The good thing about this is that we can block this system quite easily with antihypertensive drugs. Now, this is an example of how this is done. This is a child with a birthmark in the eye socket and cheek, pushing the eye upwards. This was her after one week of treatment. You see the eyes now level. This is medication twice a day by mouth. A month, five weeks later, and three years later. Another child, eight months after this, simple medication. Having found out this system, we also predicted that we can block the other enzyme, and we conducted the world's first ever clinical trial using this drug to treat this condition. This is Zoe, age five months with a large birthmark, four months after that treatment. And I was very pleased mum brought her to see me just before she went to school. Now, when I set this up, I told the truth, but not the whole truth, because <laughs> my real vision was to establish an institute dedicated to investigating disfiguring and life-threatening conditions. And I'm pleased that this institute with a state-of-the-art premises was opened end of 2013. Named after two, the two founders of plastic surgery who were great New Zealanders, Gillies and McIndoe. We were touched that we were awarded um, this for the work that we have done. Now, last year, we were invited to contribute a chapter to this two-volume state-of-the-art book on this subject by a professor from Mayo Clinic. And this was what he said in the book. Drug manufacturers in cancer research must take note of this new major paradigm shift. As you know, cancer is a problem. It would affect one out of three of us in our lifetime. In 1970, President Nixon declared war against cancer. More than a trillion dollars has been spent, but we only have modest improvement for most cancers. <coughs> and the drugs that we got are very expensive and only partially effective. The treatment, uh, a lot of my time spent treating cancer. This involves surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. And for tongue cancer, after that harsh treatment, the chance of survival is one in two. And this statistic has not changed for 40 years. 
we need to do better. We need to come up with a different concept. We need to look at cancer from a different angle. Now, we have been exploring cancer based on this concept, cancer stem cells. Just imagine ca cancer is a beehive. There's a queen bee there that produces all the worker bees. They are cancer cells. And the queen bee can duplicate themselves and make another hive. So we apply this concept to investigate cancer. And uh, I'm pleased to say that one of our students last year presented her work identifying and characterizing cancer stem cell in tongue cancer in the international meeting, and she won the top science award for that discovery. And it is also very heartening, and this article came out just recently, that scientists in Oxford and Sweden had also discovered cancer stem cell in blood cancer. Just imagine one day we do this for cancer, do cancer. I want to thank my group uh, in the GMRI and my colleagues in the DHBs and the university. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.